Uh, I'm not surprised, but this is a very nice crowd. Thank you for coming. And thank goodness we don't have lightning and no light <laughs> Remember that this was, had an abortive start. I, those of you who weren't here that night, we actually had the chairs set up. But the, because Duquesne Light kept saying it's going to be turned on by 7.30. It never was, and we finally had to scratch, and it didn't go on for another hour and a half, so it's a good decision. I'm Mike Ehrman. I'm president of the Historical Society. I always like to introduce the leadership of the group to start with. We'll start tonight with Patty Hughes in the back, who's our webmaster. Uh, our Vice President Helen Wilson is back. Helen, among other things, uh, is the editor and a prime writer in the book I'm going to talk about in a minute. Uh, we have uh, a number of board members here. Wayne Bossinger, Ralph Lund, Jim Hammond, Gene Binstock in the back selling books, and um, Toby Chapman. And Audrey Buckman running the camera. You know how you're running the camera. So we're a volunteer membership organization that's now been around for 16 or 17 years. These meetings are our biggest activity. You have a schedule of the meetings the rest of the year. We actually have all our meetings scheduled for next year already, and you'll find that on the back page. So we, we like to do things early. Interesting talk in September, different. WK, uh, KDK is coming and talking about the early history of radio. This was the first radio station in the country, you know, and they're going to come talk about that. So please join us as a, we have a six-week break, and please join us. We have a new book out. It's in the back. You can look at it. You can uh, buy it. Members are $20. Uh, Non-members are $22. Uh, we've had nice, brisk sales. Now, how many of you were here last time and heard Helen Wilson talk about the new book after the program? All right, there are a number of you here who have not had our little lecturette about that book. About after the talk, which will go on as long as uh, Josh and you all wanted to on Giant Eagle tonight, after that talk, we, uh, we will break for about 20 minutes. This is like Drew Hines, by the way, for those of you who are Drew Hines. We'll break for 20 minutes. And after that, Helen is going to, Wilson is going to do about a half hour presentation of what's in the book using PowerPoint. We invite anyone who has the time and doesn't have to get to bed to stay and, and listen. Those who don't, we have a tradition that you'll please help us take your chairs over there. Last thing I want to say before I introduce the speaker is we've been working on what we call our newspaper project, which is that we have nearly 40 years of Squirrel Hill news papers. They are already on microfiche at the Pennsylvania room down at Carnegie Library. They're available in the library at the Heinz History Center. But best of all, they will be put on a digital program where you can go in and search Northumberland Street, etc right through our website into the PIP website, which is a very highly recognized one. This isn't going to happen until the fall or winter, but we have to help out because some students have to work on it, and we've been soliciting funds. Uh, this is the last time I'm going to do it. We, we're nearing the amount we need. I thank people in the room who've contributed. There's a bottle back there if you still want to help on that as a separate project. And if you haven't joined as a member, our, our member fees are only $15 and $25, and we just love members. <laughs> Josh Shapiro, who tried to speak once before, but is back again, is a resident, grew up in Squirrel Hill, Shadyside Academy, Alderdice, Syracuse, and Brooklyn Law. He will tell you what he does at Giant Eagle, one of the founding families. We're awful happy to have you here. Good evening, everybody. Hello. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Great. For those of you who I have not had the pleasure of meeting, my name is Joshua Shapira. I'm the Area Operations Director at Giant Eagle. 
I'm currently responsible for the day-to-day -day operations of nine Giant Eagle locations right here in the city of Pittsburgh, including the Squirrel Hill store uh, up, up, uh, up the street. I've been working for the company for, for 13 years, but if you count my time in my mother's womb, I've been associated and related to the company for 45 years. I've held multiple roles in the company, including areas such as pharmacy, merchandising, human resources, and operations. The role I'm in now is by far my favorite because I'm on the front line learning and driving the business side by side with my team members and my customers. Prior to coming to uh, work at Giant Eagle, I worked as a lawyer in New York City for six years. I live here in Squirrel Hill and Point Breeze along with my beautiful wife Amanda and our two children Sophia and Gabe's who are the true loves of my life and who are here tonight. Kids, please behave. <laughs> Listen and laugh when you're supposed to. And don't fall asleep. Also here are my smiling mom and dad, the two most influential people in my life. With my mom are a couple close friends and acquaintances, and as a result, I'm not sure who's more nervous, my mom or I. Passion. Oops, sorry. Hard work. <laughs> I'm truly honored and proud to be here tonight to talk with all of you. I'm excited to share the history of something very near and dear to my heart, the founding of Giant Eagle. One of those founders was my great-grandfather, Joseph Goldstein, or Bucks as we call them. The other four founders, Benjamin Chait, Hyman Moravitz, Joseph Porter and Morris Weizenbaum all immigrated to Pittsburgh from Eastern Europe in the early 1900s. My great-grandfather lived here in the city's Lower Hill District area off Fifth Avenue, not far from Oakland. Thinking about the presentation tonight, I wanted to make sure that I made it as interesting as possible for you. Instead of just talking the entire night, I thought it would be more appealing to mix in some videos and some informational banners about the company, along with my words to give you a true comprehensive education on the history of the company. A few years ago, our company put together a video for our team members on the rich history of Giant Eagle. The content and photographs came from multiple sources, including shareholders, my cousin and our CEO, Laura Corrette, and my uncle, David, our chairman. I'd like to play it now. It is a short video that summarizes how our company began and provides a brief overview of the five founders of the company. Passion. Hard work. Innovative mindset. Competitive spirit. The foundation of today's giant ego was built upon these qualities. Qualities that made up the strong character of the men who started it all. In the early 1900s, five determined entrepreneurs, Benjamin Shade, Joseph Porter, Joseph Goldstein, Hyman Moravitz, and Morris Weizenbaum, set out to create meaningful work for themselves and to build a better life for their families and their communities. Four of the men, Shade, Porter, Moravitz, and Weizenbaum, immigrated to Pittsburgh from Eastern Europe. Goldstein was born in Pittsburgh's Lower Hill District. The Goldstein, Porter, and Shape families opened a small company and called it Eagle Grocery. Over the years, that company grew steadily to 125 stores. In 1928, the family sold Eagle Grocery to the Kroger Company. As part of their arrangement, the three families agreed to stay out of the grocery business for three years. While Eagle Grocery was busy growing its chain of stores, two other families, Moravitz and Weizenbaum, had also been building their own successful store chain named OK Grocery. In 1931, recognizing the potential for even greater prospects and with a shared commitment to their customers, the five families, Chait, Porter, Goldstein, Moravitz, and Weizenbaum, joined forces and the first Giant Eagle store opened in Pittsburgh in 1936. In local Pittsburgh area neighborhoods throughout the 1930s and 40s, 
Giant Eagle's popularity grew as both Giant Eagle supermarkets and OK Grocery Food Stores. Being that this growth took place during the challenging times of the Great Depression and World War II, is a testament to the store's value and commitment to customer service. As soldiers returned home and America found new prosperity, so did Giant Eagle. The five founders passed along their innovative spirit to the second generation of Giant Eagle leaders, who continued their steadfast commitment to entrepreneurism and care for their workers and their community. These leaders, Erwin Porter, Stanley Moravitz, Norman Weisenbaum, Saul Shapiro and Milton Shade were responsible for leading Giant Eagle through monumental growth in the late 50s and 60s. During his 30 plus years as chairman, chief executive officer and president, David Shapiro, a third generation family member, along with fellow board members, Gerald E. Shade, Edward Moravitz, Charles Porter, Norman Weisenbaum, Charles C. Cohen, Alan Gutman, and Farrell Rubenstein positioned Giant Eagle as an industry leader and took the company from a local chain of 50 grocery stores in the early 70s to an organization with more than 400 locations and $10 billion in revenue. Now, in its fourth generation of family leadership, Laura Corrette remains committed to serving our four loyal constituents, our team members, customers, communities, and shareholders, focusing on the company's long-term success and innovative growth. While there has been much growth and change over Giant Eagle's 82-year history, some things have remained the same. That sense of community and family. Our company is still owned by the original five families who remain actively involved today. The passion, hard work, innovative mindset and competitive spirit of our five founders is still reflected in our Giant Eagle family, our more than 36,000 dedicated and talented team members who work in our stores, retail support centers, and offices. In recognition of what these founding families have achieved, we should all take pride in the contributions we all make daily to continue their inspiring legacy. Giant Eagle. As the video covers, our company was founded back in the early 30s by five great men. Joseph Goldstein was the son of Lithuanian immigrants. He was born in 1888 and was the only one of the five founders born here in Pittsburgh. In 1906, he was a graduate of the Fifth Avenue High School near Oakland. After graduation, he took a job as a billing clerk with a local wholesale grocer downtown. His salary in the office was $25 a month. Eventually, he was promoted to salesman and upgraded to $25 a week. Joseph Porter was born in 1881. He came to America in 1913 without the rest of his family as a 29-year-old to avoid being drafted into the Russian army. When he came to America, he went to work for relatives who owned a storefront grocery. Joe learned about the grocery business from his aunt and uncle, but later claimed he knew more about business than they did. Benjamin Chait was born probably around the same time as Joe Porter in 1881. He originally immigrated to St. Louis in about 1913 without his wife and son from what is now the Ukraine. He moved to Pittsburgh in 1914 from St. Louis to be near his sister after the luggage factory he worked for in St. Louis went on strike. Benjamin Chait's sister was actually a boarder at Joe Porter's house. Hyman Moravitz was born in 1892 or 1893. He immigrated to Pittsburgh in 1913 from Balistok, Russia, now Poland, at the age of 21. In Europe, Hyman worked in the farms. When he came to Pittsburgh, he worked in the grocery business for $4 a week. He enjoyed talking with customers and sales and eventually made $15 a week. Finally, Morris Weizenbaum was born in Poland in 1892. He immigrated to Pittsburgh in the early 1900s. In 1916, Morris attended night classes to learn English at the Franklin School in Pittsburgh's Hill District. At school, he met Hyman. 
After quitting his original job at a grocery store because his boss refused to give him time off to get his citizenship papers, he and Hyman opened their own store, OK Grocery, on Penn Avenue. OK, OK Grocery sold mostly dry goods and canned goods, as well as onions and potatoes. In the 1920s, Morris and Hyman built OK Grocery into a chain of more than 50 stores. The competition at the time was the Great Atlantic and Pacific Tea Company, more commonly known as A&P, that grew to more than 4,600 stores by 1920. Around the same time, Porter, Chait, and Goldstein came together and formed Eagle Grocery Company. So you had OK Grocery owned by two companies, two families, and Eagle Grocery owned by the other three. Before they sold, Eagle Grocery had grown to over 125 stores. In 1931, as you saw in the video, the five founders that had been operating two separate companies, Eagle Grocery and OK Grocery, joined forces to found Giant Eagle. In 1936, the first Giant Eagle store opened. That's the first Giant Eagle store. 5,000 square foot and it was on Brownsville Road in Pittsburgh. If you're wondering how they came up with the name, the name Giant Eagle, Norman Weisenbaum, son of Morris, said his father told him that the five founders were sitting around a table brainstorming names one day. One of them said, this is going to be a big, very big store, so let's call it Big Eagle. <laughs> Somebody then said, I think it's going to be bigger than that. Let's call it Giant Eagle. <laughs> They all agreed on that name in 1931, which remains 86 years later. Five founders would continue to lead Giant Eagle through much growth and transition in the late 30s and 40s. In the 1950s, the second generation of family leaders took over the company. Those gentlemen included Erwin Porter, Milton Chait, Stanley Moravitz, Norman Weizenbaum, and Saul Shapiro. Saul Shapiro, my grandfather, was the son-in-law of my great-grandfather, Joe Goldstein, who was married to my grandmother, Frida Goldstein Shapiro. The second generation leaders were intelligent, educated businessmen who gradually established their own way of doing things, such as building stores two to four times as big as the original Giant Eagle stores. Under their leadership, the first big store, a 20,000 square foot store, was built in the South Hills Village Mall. Even back then, they knew that the South Hills store would be the number one store in the chain, which it is today. That store today, albeit in a different location, is now over 100,000 square feet. They established the company's first official offices on 17th and Smallman Street in the Strip, and then moved to 55th Street in Lawrenceville. Our corporate, head, our corporate headquarters today are now located at RIDC Park in Fox Chapel. The second generation was very successful in the 1950s. With their Blue Stamps trading program. Trading stamps was very popular in the 50s, and Giant Eagle Dedic decided to pursue this and develop their own version of that program called the PS Profit Blue Sharing Stamps. Blue Stamps. Under blue stamps, customers would save and redeem stamps for prizes. In the late 60s, after blue stamps no longer presented a competitive advantage, Giant Eagle discontinued them. As the company continued to grow in the late 60s, Saul Shapira's son, David Shapira, joined the company in 1971 as a management trainee. He was a recent MBA grad of Stanford University. David represented the beginning of the third generation of family leadership in the company. And boy, was David different. <laughs> Team members who have been with us for over 40 years recount David showing up to work with long, flowing hair, unshaven, and in flip-flops. <laughs> what a hippie he was, they would say. <laughs> Fresh from California in the 60s and 70s, Fittingly, one of David's first responsibilities for the company was to start a chain of natural food stores. The company and our operating markets were not ready for that then, but he knew even back then that at some point our customers would be. 
There are a lot of changes to Giant Eagle's grocery business in the 70s, starting with the introduction of 24-hour stores, Sunday hours, and stores that offered generics and lower-cost products. Stores also included in-store delis and bakeries. During this time, the company opened its first 50,000 square foot store and built a 480,000 square foot warehouse in the west end of the city, all in the city. Overall, the company at that time, in the 70s, was operating over 40 stores. By the late 70s, Saul had become ill and retired from an active role with the company. The five families decided David should lead the company. This is, this is the hard part. My grandfather Saul died in 1981 on a day that even as a nine-year-old, I will never forget. We were playing one of our weekly family baseball games in our country place in Ligonier. My Aunt Bonnie, who was my Uncle Ralph's wife, my dad and David's brother, came running onto the field to embrace my dad and inform him that she, of the call she just got shot, that she just got. That was the first time in my life I saw my dad cry. As Giant Eagle moved into the 80s under David's leadership, it began to diversify and grow in many new ways. For example, Giant Eagle became a full-fledged wholesaler by acquiring Tamark & Company, a warehouse and retail chain in Youngstown. In addition to supplying our corporate stores, the company also began supplying independent stores. The first independent store was in Lanaka. In 1983, the company faced a crossroads when a major union representing Giant Eagle went on strike. The company was paying the team members well above any other company. And while no one wanted to do this, we could not continue to operate and be competitive without reducing costs through a lower wage structure. Led by my dad and David, the company held firm and had to close their stores for over a month. Believing in their direction, the team members came back to work after making major, major concessions, which I still hear about today. <laughs> the same fate could not be said for our biggest competitor at the time, and by far, the biggest gorilla and supermarket company, even to this day, Kroger. Kroger decided not to act in the best interest of their team members, and instead teach the union and team members a lesson, and decided to close for good its 44 Pittsburgh stores. This created a major, major opportunity for Giant Eagle. After our strike, Giant Eagle became aggressive with their pricing strategy, and in 1984, introduced absolute minimum pricing. Anyone remember, like I do, the video which included Robert Lansing? You see a supermarket with double coupons. Do you wonder how they pay for them? Well, they don't. You do. Manufacturers only pay the coupons face value. You pay the rest in the form of higher food prices. A giant eagle doesn't offer double coupons because with absolute minimum prices, they can. Of course, they still honor manufacturers' coupons. The manufacturer pays for that, not you. The new Giant Eagle. They'll change your mind about how you should shop for food. I don't know. If, I, I just remember that as a kid. So. I just assume you would remember it. <laughs> By reducing prices on more than 7,000 items, food prices in Pittsburgh fell from the highest in the country to the third lowest. With the closing of Kroger and the introduction of AMPS, absolute minimum pricing, the company became the dominant supermarket in the Pittsburgh area. To continue to grow and differentiate the company, Giant Eagle continued to build on its, on its store within a store convenience concept by adding pharmacy, floral, automated supplies, books, magazines, greeting cards, photo, and video. Barcode scanners were installed at all checkouts and ATMs were introduced for customer convenience. In 1992, David Shapiro was appointed CEO and chairman of Giant Eagle, positions he held for 20 years until he retired in 2012. David is credited with extensive growth of Giant Eagle and many other accomplishments, including the establishment of the Giant Eagle Advantage card in 1995, which increased customer loyalty and sales, and which we still use to this day. In 1997, David saw the, the, oversaw the acquisition of 36 stores 
from Riser Foods in Cleveland, which greatly increased Giant Eagle's geographic reach and customer base. Riser was a wholesaler and retailer in Ohio, bringing the total number of Giant Eagle stores to 140 in 1997. <coughs> Not sure if you know, but we have now have more stores in Cleveland than we do in Pittsburgh. As we entered the year 2000, Giant Eagle was on the verge of becoming a multi-format retailer. 2000 was a pivotal year for many, many reasons. For that was when Laura Shapira Corret, our current president and CEO, joined the company. Laura represents the fourth generation of family leadership and is the daughter of David and my cousin. She joined the company as the vice president of marketing and spent time in operations. Laura brought even more innovation to the company, which created a launching pad for Giant Eagle to become what it is today. In 2003, Gecko was launched our successful food, fuel, and convenience retailer, which continues to evolve. Today, we operate over 200 standalone or Giant Eagle Pad Site Get-Go locations. In 2004, to increase sales and better connect and reward Giant Eagle and Get-Go customers, Giant Eagle launched Fuel Perks, a brainchild of my Uncle David's. Customers could earn rewards in the form of discounts on gas for the purchases they made in the Giant Eagle stores. No other chain in the country could offer this type of value proposition, but many of many co copy it today. Gift card sales were also introduced in 2004. Today, Giant Eagle sells over $10 million in gift cards. Around the same time, Laura was promoted to Senior Vice President of Marketing and President of new formats. She led the development, branding, and implementation efforts behind the launch of our new innovation, innovative market district concept in 2006, which has grown to 13 locations, including five in Pittsburgh, seven in Ohio, and now one in Indianapolis. In 2008, a discount banner called Value King was launched and Good Sense followed in 2012. We made the decision to exit the discount grocery business for many reasons. In addition to multi-format growth, Giant Eagle has also invested heavily in its pharmacy and specialty pharmacy operations in recent years. For instance, in 2010, Giant Eagle introduced $4 generics and free antibiotics and diabetes medications. Pharmacy remains a huge business and point of difference for us. It represents about 20% of our total sales. In 2012, David Shapiro retired and Laura was appointed CEO. Prior to her current role in, as president and CEO, Laura served as the chief strategy officer and senior executive vice president. Under Laura's leadership, growth, and out-of-pocket I'm sorry, under leader, Laura's leadership, growth and out-of-market expansion continued, and we have also made significant investments to our e-commerce business, which includes mobile apps, targeted marketing, curbside express pickup, home delivery, and e-advantage offers. Now that we've talked a lot about the history of Giant Eagle, our founders, the second, third, and fourth generations of leadership, and their many contributions. I'd like to focus on John Eagle today and the accomplishments of Laura, her executive leadership, and our entire family of John Eagle team members. To start, I'd like to share some very important culture information that describes who we are and all we do for our four loyal constituents, our team members, our customers, our communities, and our shareholders. Today, we have approximately 33,000 team members and operate more than 430 retail locations across five states with, with approximately $9.3 billion in total annual revenue. I think our founders will be proud. <laughs> our stores include traditional grocery products, the freshest perishables, restaurants, beer, wine, natural organic products, drive through pharmacies, dry cleaners, and much more. Common purpose is that together, we, the common purpose, 
pr common purpose we live by is together we improve everyone's everyday lives and well-being. Our core values are be kind, think team, step up, work smart, and live well. Our operating strategy is focused around respect for team members and operational excellence, which together produces profitable growth for our team members, our customers, our communities, and our shareholders. Corporate social responsibility is very important to us. Building on our founder's legacy, we strive to conduct our business with the highest ethical and business standards every day and serve our four constituents to the best of our ability. Ethics and integrity have always been integral parts of our company. Inclusion and diversity are also very important to us. Our HR team, along with Laura, Laura, recently produced a video. This video helps to highlight our culture and our team members' commitment to respect, inclusiveness, and service to others. Let's watch the video. Almost a century ago, five remarkable men, Joseph Porter, Benjamin Chait, Joseph Goldstein, Hyman Moravitz, and Morris Weizenbaum, came to America from different countries and different backgrounds, speaking different languages. They didn't allow their differences to divide them, though. They pulled together and made decisions together. They respected each other and trusted each other. These five separate families united as one family to build a company rooted in honesty, courage, and a deep respect for all people. The tradition of our founders remains today. Each one of us plays an important role in growing and contributing to Giant Eagle's inclusive and diverse culture for our team members, our customers, and our communities. That starts with being ethical, which includes respectful treatment of others. When we appreciate each person's unique individual background and actively seek common ground, we are putting respect for people first. Not only is this the right thing to do, it's the best possible business decision. Innovation and creativity flourish when people feel included. The more we are able to identify with each other, our customers and communities, the better we are able to meet their needs and wants. Our growth and future as a company is shaped by how well we demonstrate in our words and in our actions that everyone is valued, connected, and respected. When you see a team member or a customer, make eye contact, greet them with a smile, say hello, look at the people around you, identify and appreciate their unique contributions to our business. Everyone deserves to feel valued. Listen to each other's ideas and feedback. Go out of your way to treat each other and our customers with care. Isn't that the kind of company you want to be a part of? All new team members watch that video. And as you can see, we, we care a lot about our history, our founders, and what we stand for. And we still, to this day, uh, preach that and, uh, and live by that. Okay. Uh, I recently had a conversation with a 30-year team member who said to me that he thought our recent inclusion and diversity efforts, which this video is just a part of, was the most impactful program that he's ever experienced while at the company. Another commitment that we are very proud of is our service to our differently abled team members. I'm sure you've seen some at the Bartlett Street store. For the past 30 years, Giant Eagle has been committed to hiring, training, and supporting and advocating team for team members who are coping with a variety of physical and intellectual challenges. We are proud to partner with several community professionals, to assist our team members, such as the Blind and Vision Rehabilitation Services, Achieva, and Goodwill Industries. My cousin Jeremy Shapiro, 
proudly leads these efforts for our company. <laughs> Equally as important and our company's top priority is safety. The safety of our team members, customers, and business partners is of the utmost importance to us. At Giant Eagle, we believe safety is everyone's responsibility. We strive for a zero incident safety environment with team members, customers, food, products, pharmacy, and our fleet. Another aspect of Giant Needle that our team members are very proud of and supportive of is our team member care fund. Established in 2010, Team Member Care Fund is a 501c3 nonprofit corporation that provides financial assistance to team members in need, offering grants for emergencies or unexpected crises. The fund is completely funded by our team members. In 2016, just under 4,000 team members donated almost $400,000 to help our team members. Over the last six years, the fund has helped over 1,500 team members and provided over $2.1 million in grants to team members in need. That's what I call family. The health and well-being of our team members is also very important to us. Live well, which is one of our core values, means that we want all of our team members to live a healthy and bound life. Live well is also a living and breathing program that I was lucky enough to develop, which is committed to providing resources to support team members' health and well-being, including but not limited to annual health screenings, free vaccinations, tobacco cessation classes, fitness challenges, nutrition counseling, and life resources. For the past four consecutive years, Giant Eagle has been selected as a healthiest employer of Western Pennsylvania and Central Ohio for our commitment to team members' health and well-being. We've also received the Live Well Workplace Award for Live Well Allegheny, as well as the Gold Fit Friendly Worksite Award from the American Heart Association. China Eagle is also committed to building stronger, healthier, and happier communities. And supports more than 150 community and health, wellness, health and wellness events in five states. Some of these activities include walks, runs, biking events, fitness challenges, in conjunction with the American Diabetes Association, the American Heart Association, the Susan G. Komen, and Central Blood Bank and others. Giant Eagle, we are also passionate about being good stewards of our environment. Our sustainability mission statement is we are committed to doing business in socially and environmentally responsible ways that are good for our team members, customers, community, shareholders, and our planet. Perhaps what we are most proud of is our commitment and belief in serving our communities. Our community service pillars include hunger relief, education, nutrition, and community enrichment. We are strong supporters of the food banks and every market we operate as well as the educational partnership, which provides school supplies to um, underprivileged kids and United Way. To give you a specific example of our commitment to the food banks, annually we donate over six million meals, worth about $1.2 million. We also host large food drives in our stores, including the Fall Food Share in Pittsburgh and Erie, and the Harvest for Hunger drive in Cleveland and a hunger drive in Columbus as well. That's all I have. <laughs> impacted greatly. Um, I think the biggest trend these days um, is that people are ordering lots of food, lots of products online. And I think people uh, don't have the time to go to the grocery store. 
Um, I think we just uh, rolled out our curbside program to try to deal uh, with that. We're piloting home delivery ourselves. Um, and I just don't, I don't know the exact answer, but I know it's going to impact us. Go ahead. I think the thing I admire most about John Nickel and the Shapiro family, first of all, I enjoy your market district store. It's a food adventure for me. But what I admire, and I've been in several of your stores, is how you accommodate challenged people. Mm -hmm. And you make them part of your operation. It says something about the heart of your company. So I, I, I commend you for it. Thank you very much. It was a great presentation. Thank you. I, I wonder if you know about, if, if you can tell us anything about the history of Giant Eagle in Squirrel Hill, which were the first stores to open in Squirrel Hill. Do you know the dates? And were some of them Kroger stores before? I can, I can say, uh, based on research we've done, we never found a Kroger store here. And by the way, I can't resist this. There's some stuff in, in our book in terms of when the first stores were open here. Uh, uh, in uh, Chinese world, yeah. So you can look at it. There's a business chapter. And we, we spent quite a bit of time on Giant Eagle and its antecedents. It's an important part of the neighborhood. I know you, you asked me that. I wasn't able to find the answer. The, the original Murray Avenue store was across the street from where it is now. Do you know when it actually moved back and forth? Uh, going back into the 50s, because I worked in the 50s. And did Star Markets become Giant Eagle Street? No, we haven't bought Star Markets. But there was a, a store no, Red Shield. Yeah. Across the Red Shield, uh, two or three stores down. Uh, no, that was down here. Didn't you have a short-term store? I think you did down near where the Starbucks is now. Yeah. That at yeah. one point yeah. there was, that was Starbucks. That, that was Star Market, which at one point in time became a giant. You didn't yes. you didn't buy Star Market. You just used the space. You the space. That's right. And then where the store on Loretta yeah. Avenue is, that used to be an old public school. Yeah. Uh, Roosevelt. 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 Roosevelt School. Roosevelt. Right. <laughs> which we purchased, got permission from the city to purchase, and then built that store. And I worked as a clerk in that store in my teenage years. Well, the fuzzy in the back of my mind, and I might be wrong about this, wasn't there also a store in that uh, shopping area where the, uh, uh, the Holocaust Center yes. is at the very end? That was a food bank. That was a Kroger's. Was that a Kroger's? I don't think it was, it was a food It was a food lamp. It was a food lamp. You're right. I'm sorry. When, when the Kroger closed in 84, we bought a number of their locations. The Shop and Save purchased the majority of their locations. Mm -hmm. That's what really launched Shop and Save in yeah. Who is your competition? <laughs> Every, everyone. <laughs> That's a good answer. Really. Um, I, I think, uh, and, it, and the answer is, uh, is it, that's true. Uh, I, we've never faced such tough competition. Um, Aldi, uh, Walmart, Walmart is our biggest competitor. Oh, okay. It's everybody's biggest competitor. Um, you don't see that as much in the city because we don't have Walmart stores. Uh, but across our operating markets, Walmart's the biggest. But we, we face Walmart, we face Aldi as a huge competitor. I just, I, one of my stores is the waterfront and the Aldi's on the way, the waterfront across the train tracks. Must have been 60 cars in that store today. It being the first of the month, it's a discount store. A lot of people are money to shop. Um, shop and Save is still around. Um, I think Amazon is a huge competitor and will be a huge competitor. Um, go ahead. Where would um, one purchase some shares of your company? <laughs> I say ask my dad, but I don't think he'll tell you. <laughs> no, I understand. Uh, then the last thing I'll say, uh, my compliments for having 
UFCW in your that is one of the most responsible um, well I'm from Port Portland Oregon we're from Portland Oregon yeah. and UFCW has probably the best reputation of any entity in Portland Oregon um, they uh, contribute to and, and cooperate with so many ways and their employees are as diverse as your characterization. Mm -hmm. My respect and admiration. We, we have generally good relations with the, with, with the union. Um, I think they value the history of Giant Eagle, they value us being here, they know what would happen if Giant Eagle didn't, you know, wasn't here because most of our competition is non-union. Uh, and overall, we have relatively good uh, relations with them. Those few stories you see on the news are just a couple people that are acting out, but in general, it's a good it's a good relationship. Josh, I have some. Uh, I lived in D.C. before we came up. There were th there are three giant chains in uh, D.C., Philly, and here. They all have the name Giant in them. But you're saying that that's an accident. <laughs> that's not us. Uh, that's not a. Con but but the other part of it is that the other two chains were both uh, developed by well-known Jewish families in the two cities, but have now sold out, sold out to a Dutch company. Yeah. How have you been able to resist that? I think a lot of that has to do with being a family company uh, and having members of the family running the company. Uh, I think a lot of companies that are family you know, bring in other executives and CEOs and they sort of lose that, lose that family and hometown, home, hometown feel. Uh, but we've always been run by our family. So, you know, and Laura's the latest CEO and we have a commitment, you know, a deep commitment to uh, our, mar our markets uh, you know, that we operate. I mean, who don't know what the future will hold, uh, but I think that's the key. The key element is the, is the family uh, connection and the family leadership, in my opinion. Uh, I've noticed a variation in the price of gasoline at the various get to station there. There's not a consistency there. Can you comment at all on the relationship and how that's established? I think a lot of those prices are dictated by what the competition is doing in those markets. So it may not be different because we may have an aggressive competitor, whether it's a Sheets or a Sunoco uh, or a Marathon or a Speedway. So the, these stores are able to set their own prices uh, to compete with the people around them. And I think that's what dictates the price, most of all, other than the market itself, which fluctuates. Is that a franchise or say you station itself? And, and you just use the name and they have a, they have no, a no, relationship? No, no, we own, well, we, own the, the, yeah, uh, we own the geckos. And we have some geckos that are on our pad that are on the supermarket site like the waterfront, and then we have some like Bomb Boulevard that are by themselves. In any event, Gecko themselves runs the standalones, but Gecko is is Giant Eagle. Back. Back. Um, are the children of the other four founders still active in the business? And if so, how do you interact? Do you still have the same closeness of the founders? Yeah, we're, we got along really well. We got along so really well. So Laura, um, Laura's obviously the CEO, and Laura's brother is Jeremy, and he he leads um, the the efforts with the the uh, impaired or their challenge key members. Myself, Dan Magrish, um, is a relative of the Moravitz family. Um, Ari Ari was with the company. Um, this is Marcel Apter, by the way, who's the sister of. Um, Stanley Moravitz. Uh, so she's another Giant Eagle family member in the audience. And she, she has relatives uh, that have worked at the company. Um, and I believe that's it. There's some Chucky Porter doesn't work for us anymore. Yeah, Chucky Porter, who's on the board, he's retired. But we, but we, we all get along. It's really. It's very unique, as my uncle would say. He <laughs> says to me, every time we go on a ride day, you have no idea how unique this is. <laughs> and there was, there was tough times because when David became the CEO, 
I think there was folks in his generation that wanted to be the CEO. And in fact, um, one of those uh, gentlemen actually moved out of Pittsburgh as a result. Um, but uh, I think, but for that, there really hasn't been much competition or challenge. Uh, and we all respect each other and love each other and support each other. Do you have any rules of restricting the number of family members in each generation? No. <laughs> I want more. I'm not asking about that because no, there's a right. rumor around to that effect. But no. No. Not that I'm aware of. I think my son, my son has a question. Go ahead. I would say Super Giant Eagles was the first door made. Where does it say that? Um, it's a super giant eagle market. Oh, yeah, it's super a super giant eagle market. It's a giant eagle's in the super. Oh, it's super market. Good question. It's a good question, Gage. Hopefully, you'll work for a giant eagle one day. You didn't mention Costco. Is Costco a big uh, competitor? Or? Yes. Yes, that's another trend. Uh, the, bulk, the bulk supermarket. I go to a lot of parties where they have Costco cakes, and I want to just take them and throw them in the garbage. <laughs> but, but yes, I think people who don't want to go to the supermarket as much as others you know, like to go to Costco and stock up. We've experimented ourselves with um, bulk purchases that takes up a lot of space in the store, and we end up having to give it give up space that we don't want to give up. Um, but I think, again, I think co places like Costco are in trouble, too, with the online. Because I yes, think people are, are going to eventually, and still now, order a lot of that bulk, bulk product uh, to home. Any other questions? Sort of an observation. It's sort of interesting that um, home delivery was very big, say, before World War II. Okay. And, then kind of, and, then kind of, and then it's come back. You know? Yeah, we're piloting it in the South Hills. And we're not sure. We, we don't want to roll it out until we get it right. What are you piloting? I'm sorry. Uh, home delivery. Oh. But it's so much fun to go to a giant eagle. It's yeah. crazy. Yeah. When you're retired, too. <laughs> have, any of you try, have any of you tried the curbside, the curbside concept yeah. where you order ahead? Um, it was great. I was in a meeting the other day, and I was talking to a woman who loves curbside because, you know, her husband still thinks she goes into the store. <laughs> so she order she orders it, she goes out for ninety minutes and does whatever she wants and then she comes, <laughs> and then she comes home with the product. <laughs> Her husband doesn't know any different. <laughs> she she loves it. Uh, but we just rolled it out in one of my stores at Waterfront, so I encourage you to try uh, I encourage you to try it out. Who's gonna squeeze the fruit for us? <laughs> that is a challenge because you have the eight dollar an hour team members picking your meat. But we, we go through a lot of training with them on on what people like, um, and uh, I think a lot of the products are the dry goods. But they they are they are ordering their perishable products, and then the amount of purchases is like three or four times as much as a as a as an in store trip. So if the average basket size is thirty dollars a basket, um, you know that's like a hundred dollars a basket or one hundred and twenty, which is you would see why we want to do. Why, why would we want to do that? Plus, Walmart, Kroger are, are all doing it. Is the uh, Settlers Ridge Market District the biggest store, the biggest square footage, or are some of your other ones in Indianapolis or so forth, are they larger? I think, I think, market, I think the Settlers Ridge is the biggest. I think it's about 130,000 square feet, and it's, okay. it's too big. Um, so as we, build, okay. as we build newer stores, we're back. building them smaller. Have the, okay. You have the, um, the, in, in, in she said you had milk up front. Remember you had milk and eggs up front? You could just run to get it. Yeah. And you moved to the back. Is that because you want people to cover the stage? <laughs> no, it's, it might be because of the changes we made for curbside, but there still are a lot of stores that have that we call it a convenience cooler right. to make it easier. And if we don't have it, I can ask about it and see if we can get it back. Uh, but that, that is not, I mean, historically, we've had those things in the back of the store to get customers to walk through. That's how every supermarket has. But we realize that, you know, customers' needs have changed. And we, we want to be able to get that, 
that quick in and out customer. And so we typically do have that um, in some of our newer stores. Uh, Squirrel Hill is a dense, densely populated neighborhood, yes. pretty much. And yet the Squirrel Hill store on Murray is awfully small. Have you tried to figure out a way to have a bigger store? <laughs> Go on. <laughs> I, think, I think that's probably uh, the store that if we could remodel and expand anywhere, we would. That would be the one. But the, the neighborhood and the landlords and the tenants are really tough. It's really, really, really hard to grow this way in that location. Uh, the last time I took my boss, boss's boss there, uh, he actually th was throwing around the idea of maybe going building up, but you know it's an older clientele, and you know we don't want to inconvenience uh, customers. I, I will tell you, it is one of my stores that I manage, and we are currently looking at putting some money into it to upgrade it because it, it looks like it came out of the 50s. It looks like it's the first store that we opened. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm pushing I'm pushing for some money uh, to be invested. We just, we just uh, put a little money into the Greenfield store. I don't know if any of you shop in Greenfield. It is a lot nicer, prettier, you know. Uh, it's still also landlocked and it's hard. It's hard, it's, a, it's not um, a growing store, but we wanted to make sure the store was nice. So. It's good to have a family member as one of the, the supervisors of the store. You'll see some, hopefully you'll see some improvements uh, in the Squirrel Hill store as well. There's nothing I would like more to make that store bigger uh, and better. I hear it from my mom all the time. <laughs> and and uh, we're going we're gonna to try our best. We have this expanding Asian population in, the, uh, in Squirrel Hill. Mm -hmm. Are you adjusting to that at all? I think I think we try. I think probably Market District in um, in Shady Side probably does a better job than than the Squirrel Hill. Again, with such a small store, it's really hard to to invest. And we you know we've made investments in the kosher bakery and in the kosher products. Uh, we're still evaluating whether that makes sense um, to keep doing that. Um, but it's hard to add in a store where. You know, you're going to have to give up bread, and you're going to have to give up, you know, ketchup, and people like those things. <laughs> More people like that than, than the ethnic food. Go ahead. Hi, two things. I actually like a small store, and Good. That's, that isn't the store that I go to. And thank you for having the kosher department at the Giant Eagle, um, at the Market District in Shadyside. Um, I do go there sometimes, and it's, it's, you know, it's a nice convenience, so thank you. Welcome. Is there any chance of putting a small store in Oakland? All these students there, you've got, you know, if there's just no growth plans? I don't, I, there's no current plans. Uh, there's not a lot of real estate, I think, available in Oakland that isn't already purchased by, you know, UPMC or, <laughs> or someone like that. Um, I think we used to have a store right on Summer. Yeah, right on Atwood Street. Um, I think where the CVS is. That where the CVS is? Yeah. Uh, that, that was by far our most pilfered. And I don't know how CVS does it. I mean, the, the shoplifting is really bad in the city. Um, but uh, that's not why we wouldn't open the store. But I think it's more of a real estate. Um, and you know, focusing on on taking care of the stores that we have because uh, we're under attack by competition versus versus opening up new stores in smaller in smaller markets. Um, your presentation did um, sort of quickly um, include the philanthropy of. John Eagle and the founders and the Shapiro family, and I would just like to publicly commend you. Um, I am not old enough to remember the first generation, but I can certainly um, attest to the philanthropy of the second and the third generations. Um, donating not only financially, but their time and their experience, um, sharing organizations of all kinds. Um, it really um, 
the founders of Giant Eagle and their offspring have really contributed extraordinarily to this community in particular and to the city of Pittsburgh in general. And um, now that the fourth generation is moving up, I would like to encourage you to get involved in the same way that your parents and grandparents mm -hmm. and great-grandparents did. Thank you. And we're very, very proud of that. I think we don't like to brag about it, but purposely not in the presentation. I think it's something we've struggled with about advertising how much money we give to the communities because there's not a lot of companies that give as much as we do. But we typically don't you know, reveal that or brag about it. We just do it because it's the right thing. But it's it's the right thing money. to do. It's leadership. Your time. Okay. It was worth the wait, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> It's, uh, it's just after 8.30. We're going to reconvene at 9. That gives folks a chance to look at the board, chat with each other, take out some equipment. As I said, we'll be here till about 9.30, those of you who want to sit and listen to the book presentation. Thank you for coming. Come back in September. And uh, it's great to see you. And move your chairs if you're leaving.